Let's pray before we open God's Word together. Father, we thank you for your Word. We know and we trust that it's living and active. We ask you to speak to us through it now. Open our hearts to it as you open it to our hearts. We pray in the name of the living Word, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> if you've been with us, you know we're in a series called Growing Smaller. This is, as I said before, not a, a spiritual weight loss series. It's a series about the paradox of spiritual greatness. What is greatness in God's eyes? And our definition for what greatness is in, in, in God's de- eyes is, comes from the book of Matthew. If you've been following with us, you know Matthew chapter 20. You can turn there with me if you want. It's not on the screen. Verses 25 through 28. And the context, of course, is that James and John and the other disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to have the places of honor when Jesus finally brings in the kingdom? And they're thinking, of course, overthrow Caesar and Rome and bring the kingdom in. And they send their mother, James and John, their mom, moms haven't changed a whole lot in 2,000 years, to ask Jesus the question, Who, where are my boys going to be? Here's part of Jesus' answer. Jesus called out to them and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you, must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the heart of our series, Growing Smaller. We're trying to take this central growing smaller principle of being a servant. That's what greatness is. That's how God defines greatness, serving others, and applying that to every area of our lives. We've talked about our families, our marriages, the workplace, our neighborhoods. Today I want to talk about what does it mean to grow smaller in the church, in relationships inside the family of God? How does that look? There are lots of places we could go, and we'll get there in just a minute. But let me ask you this question, uh, you know, on a totally unrelated note, because it just occurred to me. Um, you know, two weeks ago, we, we talked on Mother's Day about marriage, growing smaller in marriage. If you were here, you might, might remember that sermon. Um, and I talk, we talked about how Paul anchors the marriage a marriage relationship in the creation account. A man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. Well, on Mother's Day, my boys and I were weeding in the backyard because that's what my wife wanted for Mother's Day. My son noticed that a car would be much easier. Yes, it would. We were pulling weeds. It was hot. We were miserable. And Benjamin said, this is terrible. What can we go inside? And Noah said, out of the blue, my older son, he said, "Eh, I don't know. They have to give birth. We get to pull weeds. I'll take it. So I I thought that was pretty funny, and it's not related to the sermon at all. Anyway, let me ask you this question. If, I, if you could imagine that you're a sociologist from some part of the world, or another planet even, that had no knowledge whatsoever about North American culture, hard to think of in our global culture today, but you're from somewhere that had no knowledge at all about American culture, and you were sent here uh, as to study our culture and report back on who, who do these people think are great? Who is elevated? Who's celebrated? Who, who does this culture value? My guess is it would not be servants. Now, we would say we like servants. We like people to serve. We like the idea of service. We have service industries, right? And especially when it's done for us or to us, we like to be served. Jesus says, even as the Son of Man, referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's our model. That's our pattern. That is not what our culture celebrates or honors, but it is what God honors inside and outside of his church. What if I was to ask you this question? What's the greatest gift you can possibly imagine? You know how in the, in the, in the movies, if you come across a genie, which don't exist, by the way, but, um, and you're always given three wishes. Well, the first thing you should do is what? Ask for more wishes, right? I mean, just get that out of the way. If, you, if that ever does happen, make sure. Well, what if you had one? What if God said, I'll give you one thing? You could ask one thing of me. What's the greatest gift you could possibly imagine God giving you? Alexander the Great was once asked by a member of his court, came and asked, a lower member of his court came and asked him for financial aid for his family. His family was uh, falsely accused of death. They were in real trouble. He came and asked the, the great uh, you know, conqueror of all, of all the known world at that time uh, for a, a, an astronomical sum. It would have been like a half a million dollars in our culture. And the treasurer, royal treasurer tried to refuse him out of hand. But Alexander stood up and said, no, this man is, pay him every cent and double it because this man has done me a great honor. And they, everyone looked in, in confusion. He says, this is the, the quote, by the largeness of his request, he shows that he understands both my wealth and my generosity. Because he asks such a crazy amount from me, he says he believes I can and I will pay it. So he's honored me by his request. So God has infinite 
Knowledge, power, presence, everything belongs to him. You, you come to God and you can ask him for one thing. What would it be? The greatest gift you can imagine. The scripture says we've already been given it. We've already been given it. Those of us who have trusted in Christ have been given the greatest gift, and it's the Holy Spirit. The greatest gift that God can give because in giving of his Holy Spirit, God gives himself. What, what could you ask that's bigger than God? God, I want you. I want you in me. In me. I want your spirit in my life. All other gifts God gives to us as his children are through his Holy Spirit. They flow out of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. The Apostle Paul saying here, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. He set his seal of ownership on us, puts his spirit in our hearts if we trust Christ. All other gifts God gives, he gives in and through his Holy Spirit. Not only is the Holy Spirit the greatest gift that God can give, it's a gift that God never refuses and one that he gives freely. It's what Moses wished for in Numbers 11, that all God's people would have his spirit. It's what Joel predicted in Joel chapter 2, that God would pour out his spirit on young and old, men and women alike. It's what Peter explained in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost when he said, we're not drunk like you think. God is pouring out his spirit on us. It's now been given to everyone, everyone here and everyone in this, on this planet who trusts Christ's death for their sin. God gives you his spirit. We've talked about this in the past, but turn, if you will, if you have your Bibles or look on the screens, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's lots of places where we could talk about something called spiritual gifts. We're going to look at this one, probably the signature text on spiritual gifts. Before we get to this text, let me ask you this question. Who's the most gifted person you know? Who's the most gifted person you know? Whatever name came to your mind, turn and tell the person next to you. Who is somebody you know or know about who's extremely gifted? Go ahead, tell somebody next to you. Out loud, I know it's weird to talk in church, but go ahead, I'm letting you. It's not a secret, you don't have to whisper. My guess is a few of you named an athlete, maybe? Somebody famous? Who's gifted in our culture? Who's gifted? We were talking about LeBron James, my son and I, earlier today. And I don't like him, I don't know why, I don't know him. I shouldn't dislike him. I love him with Christ's love, but I dislike him for some reason when I watch him play. And I want him to lose tonight. Anyway, leaving that aside. No one can deny the guy's a remarkably gifted athlete. God has poured out some remarkable physical skills and talent, just his size and his speed and so forth. Spiritually speaking, when it comes to the gift of the Holy Spirit, you all have, if you trust Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says not only that, you have God's Spirit, but God's Spirit has uniquely given each one of you who trusts Christ a spiritual gift or gifts, greater than the number of zero. So spiritually speaking, in God's family, you are all gifted people, remarkably gifted people. You may not think of yourself as a gifted person. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, how, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 7, to each one, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit. To each person who trusts in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin, the Spirit enters into your life and gifts you. You might not think of yourself as a gifted person, but God does. If you have his Holy Spirit, you are gifted. Now, what are spiritual gifts? What are they exactly? Spiritual gifts are abilities that God gives through his Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of serving others in the body of Christ. That's basically a repackaging of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Every believer is given a spiritual gift or gifts 
for the purpose of serving others, that's the growing smaller principle, serving other people in the body of Christ. Not necessarily the same thing as natural talent. People get this confused all the time. Humanly speaking, to call someone gifted means they have a level of talent or ability beyond the average person, right? That person's gifted. I don't have what they have. I remember when I was in college, uh, we would have these things. I went to Wheaton College, and I was on the football team there, and we had what they called senior shares. In your senior year, we had chapel every week before our, our, our games, and the seniors would give up, get up and talk about their experience. And most of them would just get up and talk about how much it meant to them, which was what I did. Talk about how important the last four years had been in their life, and it's a great great thing. I remember those fondly. One senior share from my senior year stands out above them all. A guy named Devin Leftwich. Devin was our tailback. Uh, it looked like God just chiseled a tailback when he made Devin. Devin was just, you know, he was just naturally gifted on the field. But he was a quiet kid. He was the last one in the locker room and the first one out. None of us really knew him all that well. He was sort of aloof. We thought he was maybe arrogant, but he was just shy. For his senior share, he, got, he walked up there and he uh, sat down at the piano that didn't happen. We didn't, nobody else on the team played piano, as far as I knew. And he closed his eyes, and he played Chopin for 10 minutes. No music. Just beautiful. Beautiful. Flawless, as far as I could tell. And he got up, and he said, I, you guys all know me on the field. I just wanted you to know me, another side of me. And he went and sat down. It was like silent, you know, a bunch of meatheads going, whoa, where did that come from? Devin had uh, never learned to read music. He played the Suzuki method. was a remarkably gifted pianist. As great as he was on the field, he was a better piano player. And none of us had any idea. When I talk about natural talent, that's the kind of thing we talk about, right? Somebody who just has a talent, a human ability beyond the average person, far beyond. Sometimes God gives a spiritual gift and it comes down on top of a natural talent. You already have this talent. God made you this way. You trust in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and he comes down over that talent and raises it up and uses what you already had for his glory. That can happen. That can be a way God gifts people. Other times... The Spirit comes down and gifts somebody in spite of a lack of natural talent. This also happens. Illustration for this, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a famous preacher in London of the previous generation, was a remarkable orator, gifted communicator, whether he was a believer or not, just could talk. D.L. Moody had a stuttering problem and a serious lack of self-confidence. Both remarkable preaching ministries, both gifted preachers. I've known people who've said to me, well, I don't have a gift. I don't think I have a spiritual gift. The Bible is clear on this point. Every Christian has a spirit, therefore, every Christian has a spiritual gift. If you think you don't have it, you're just not paying attention. You're not praying and looking hard enough for what it is. Some of you might already have an idea what your spiritual gift is. Others of you may never have thought about it before. Now, Paul does kind of give us a, a list here, but and there are several other places in the book of Ephesians and other places in in 1 Timothy, where gifts are listed, but there, nowhere are we given an exhaustive list. We're given uh, illustrative lists, suggestive lists. So I don't think it's trying to find like a needle in a haystack. I think it's best to understand spiritual gifts in terms of what I would call their clusters. There's three, three clusters of spiritual gifts. The first one is prophetic gifts. Evangelism, preaching, teaching, prophecy. And by the way, prophecy is not prophecy Biblically defined, the Old Testament was, was by God's Spirit predicting things that were to come. I think prophecy is best understood today as when God uses someone to speak a challenging word to God's people. I don't think it's fortune-telling kind of stuff. Anyway, prophetic gifts, meaning gifts up front, preaching, teaching, public ministry gifts. Then there are priestly gifts. In the Old Testament, the priests were caring for God's people, uh, helping them for the remission of sins, helping others, mercy, giving, uh, compassion, Healing, these are priestly gifts. Caring for other people and their physical and spiritual needs. Kingly gifts. Wisdom, leadership, vision, administration. That's, that's the cluster. So does that make sense? There's prophetic gifts up front, speaking, teaching gifts. Then there are priestly gifts. Sort of, a lot of them are behind the scenes, helping from behind the scenes to help and, and, and encourage and strengthen and heal and minister to other people's needs. And there are kingly gifts, leadership Vision, administration, strategic thinking, people that are, that are great leaders. The reason this is so important is that spiritual gifts are never intended to operate in isolation. So one time I was at a conference years ago and a, a guy out that was speaking said, he, he made the comment as if he was quoting the Holy Spirit, how dare, how dare you honor yourself with what I've given you, says the Holy Spirit. I wrote that down in my Bible. I think that's, the, God does not give us gifts so that we could draw attention to ourselves. So there's different clusters. And also, 
because gifts are not meant to be used in, in independent of each, like, like in total isolation. We're dependent on each other. The best example I know about this that I've experienced is what years ago, you saw Brock and Nancy in Quito, Ecuador in the skate park church. In, in the summer of 99, when I was a youth pastor here, we took our first trip to Quito, Ecuador as a church. I took a group of about 20 high school students and five or six leaders, adult leaders. Part of our ministry there was to go to the dump. I think I've shared this story in different contexts before. The dump uh, in, in Quito, Ecuador, it's, thir- it's the developing country, of what we call the third world back then, and it's, it was a pretty foul place. Um, it's, imagine you know, your trash you put out, on, for us it's Thursday morning, whatever you put your garbage out. Uh, if you don't know this, when you put your garbage out, there are guys who drive by look for anything that's recyclable, aluminum, copper, and so forth, probably before you're even awake. They take that out of there. Then the garbage man comes by, and I was a garbage man for one summer. That was a fun job. Actually, I remember one time being in, we, we, I was in the north part of Wheaton for my job. I rode in the back of the truck, and I remember we pulled up this big, beautiful home with a pool, and uh, these girls were outside sunning themselves in their bathing suits, and I jumped off the truck, and I'm grabbing uh, garbage, throwing in the back of the truck. And I thought, hey, ladies, and they're looking at me, and I thought, and they kind of looked at me, they looked away, and I went, what? And I realized, I'm the garbage man. <laughs> Nobody looks excitedly at the garbage man, you know? So anyway, so the, your garbage man comes by your house, and he looks over your trash and takes stuff out. I used to do this. I found a, a radio that I fixed and a basketball just needed to be pumped up. And they take stuff out of your garbage that they might want as well. Then he goes to the dump. And there are workers at the dump that separate the recyclables and organize that as well. People take it out of there. In the third world, imagine that, that trash picked over two or three more times. That's what gets dumped in the Quito city dump. And there are people, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating for the sake of the story here. At that time, there are people living in the trash making their homes out of whatever they could find. Women rushing to the trucks with pots to take anything edible that they could boil and feed to their family. Children so filthy, it's hard to imagine for you to imagine it. And we would go to this place and want to wash hair, uh, bring, bring, buy a stock of bananas as tall as me for like $4 and just bring as much food as we could carry on this bus, hand it out and spend time with these people. Now, by God's grace, there's a remarkable ministry there. There's a clinic, there's a church, there's a school. There are remarkable things that are happening there. It's happened in the last decade or more. Let me tell you how it happened. Some people who saw this went to the dump like this and saw just the filth and the squalor. They were, their immediate response is, we have to feed these people. We have to get them medical help. We have to, to help them get clean. We have to take care of their needs. What kind of gifts are those? Priestly. They're moved with compassion by the plight of these individual people. And so they'll mortgage everything they have to serve their physical needs. They're priestly, that's their cluster, right? That's how their heart responds to that need. Some people came to these, these people in the dump, and they were, sure they cared about their hunger and their, and their physical needs and their sickness, but they were thinking, these people are hopeless spiritually. They need the gospel. Someone's got to tell them while we're feeding them that there's a God who loves them and give them the message of the kingdom. That there's hope beyond this life. What kind of gifts are those? Prophetic gifts, right? I want to teach you about this God who you don't know. And then there were other people that came and saw this and that thought, we got to get organized. we got to put together a sustainable ministry that's going to last, that can feed and teach and help these people over the course of generations to change the cycle of pain here. What kind of gifts are those? Kingly gifts. And that all, over time, all three clusters came together in that place. And now if you go there, it's remarkable what's happening. And by the way, there's a reason we use these three clusters. We don't have prophets, priests, and kings walking around today like the Old Testament. But Jesus in the New Testament is referred to as our great prophet. We don't need another prophet because we have Jesus, the great prophet. Our high priest, read the book of Hebrews. He's our great high priest. And he's our true king, the king of kings. When these things come together in the church prophet, priest, and kingly gifts together in the church. The world gets a picture of Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. Some of you, when, when you see needs, your heart is moved. Let's do something. Let's do something. Some of you are moved. I, I, I want to tell these people of the message of truth. And some of you are thinking, man, we, are, we got people running around willy-nilly doing all this feeding and teaching. We got to get together and organize it. And I think that's what, how God intends the church to operate according to those three clusters. This is why the church is called the body of Christ. We say in the song, we are the body, right? We are the body. Or at least uh, Craig and his son sang it for us. So when we use our spiritual gifts as God intended, we become the physical representation of God on earth, his body. God's love, Jesus' activity on display. That's what we're called to do. 
But before we get into this, uh, a, a couple words about how you know what your gift is. I want to say a couple things about the difference between gifts and what the Bible calls fruit. It's crucial that you understand the difference here. Gifts are what the Holy Spirit does through us. Fruit is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. Just because you're using, and you have to be clear about this, gifts are not fruit. But many people confuse the two. Just because you're using your spiritual gift in service, in the church, does not necessarily mean you're growing in the fruit of the Spirit in your own life. Let me be really frank about this and personal for a minute. My spiritual fruit could be in the toilet. Galatians chapter 5, you've probably heard about it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit. That's what God wants to do in your life to make you a more loving, patient, peaceful, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled man or woman. That's, what God, that's the fruit God wants to produce in your life. It's possible, God forbid, that my spiritual fruit could be just terrible. I could be an angry, bitter, resentful, out-of-control person at home. But I could still show up here and give a good sermon because I've developed a skill. And I could fool some people, maybe even myself, maybe most of you. And preach a good sermon, and God might even use that to touch somebody's life. But eventually, it's going to run me into the ground and others as well. Gifts without fruit is like a tire without air. You can run on it for a while, but you're going to grind to a halt eventually. They're, not, they're different things, but they're meant to go together. God, and I, will, I, I think some people might take issue with this, but I firmly believe it. God is far more interested in the fruitfulness of your life than in your giftedness. Now, he's gifted you. He wants to use that, but not at the expense of you growing and becoming more loving and patient and peaceful and kind and gentle and faithful and self-controlled person. Remember a young man years ago who sort of, he was doing an un, 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 unofficial, unofficial? That's a word internship at our church. One, and he, he was a gifted communicator, and he wanted to be a preacher. He had read the great preachers. He wanted to give lots of messages. He was always asking me for more opportunities in youth ministry, and he was sort of a young man in a very great hurry. And um, when I tried to f focus him on, I even said to him, God cares much more about who you are than what you're doing and where you go. And he's like, yeah, 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 I know, but I want to teach this. He got frustrated at our church and left and joined kind of a big national evangelism ministry traveling around, and he is a gifted guy. In many ways, he was far, far outstripped where I was at his age. But I heard many, many, well, probably four or five years later that he had burned out, dropped out, and wasn't serving anywhere at the time. Don't make the mistake of operating just in your natural ability or even your giftedness. Don't mistake the operation of your spiritual gift for the growth of fruit in your life. It's easy to see gifts in action, right? You can tell when somebody's using their gift. It's not always as easy to see fruit, is it? You have to get up close. When I was working in Angola, a prison in, um, I was there for a couple times last spring, a prison in Louisiana, a very large penitentiary. Some of you have heard about jailhouse conversions. You heard about this, men in prison who profess faith in Jesus, but it's really more for their own comfort, their own security, or to feel like they have a sense of belonging, or because they feel like the culture wants them to. But it's hard to tell how sincere they are. Sometimes they do it to convince the uh, parole board or the warden or the officers that they're, that they're a good, good man now. And I asked the chaplain there, Robert Tony, I said, how do you know if these guys are sincere? How do you know what's a real conversion, what's a jailhouse conversion? You know what he said? We have two things that you don't have in the church in the suburbs, time and proximity, he said. <laughs> we, they're not going anywhere. We see them every day. And it's up close. They sleep on a bunk right next, you know, we, we see them day after day after day after day up close. And that's how we know if there really is a transformation taking place in their heart, in their spiritual fruit, or if it's just talk. I think it happens for us too, maybe not as easily. When you get to know somebody, you see them in different contexts. You see them outside of church. You see me in the grocery store, in the community, you see each other. And we're not, you know, we're not all dressed up looking nice on, on Saturday or Sunday playing the church game. You see them in different contexts. You know, I, my daughter is a, is a basketball player at Batavia High School. And we had a um, holiday tournament over Thanksgiving this past year in Oswego. And they're playing a team for the championship of the tournament. And I was a little worked up in the tournament. 
The guy next to me is going off on the official, calling him hairpiece, because he was wearing a hairpiece, just screaming at him, being brutal to the guy. And I'm not saying much to the official, but I'm sort of uncomfortable how much this guy's screaming. But I am tense about this. I thought they were fouling my daughter. Every parent thinks they're fouling your kid, right? And finally they called one. And I said, great call. You sure it wasn't an offensive foul? Being sarcastic. The referee wheels around and said, that's it. You want to go? To me. And I went, go where? He said, out. You're out. I went, my wife is like looking down. You know, you know. <laughs> You're out. Out. Like, do you want to fight? What do you want to do? What are you saying out? He walks over to the bench and tells him the guy in the red sweatshirt has to go. I, went, I was so humiliated. I was, part of me was the injustice of this thing, right? It was the other guy that was yelling the whole game. But most of it was a shame. What's the matter? You know. So I walk out there and I sit out in the, it was like two minutes left. I sit out in the cafeteria, all embarrassed. And the, the guy who runs the tournament says, you got to go outside. It's, it's freezing. You know, it's 20 below zero. I go, my wife has my keys. I'm like, it's too bad. I'm sorry. It's the policy. So I had to stand outside for another two minutes. The walk of shame. Then all the parents file by. You know? <laughs> my wife comes last. Like, I'm a little kid. Let's go. You know, driving home, I thought I was... I was I was, you know, talking about how unjust it was. Three weeks later, here at Sunday morning, a guy walks up to me and says, Hey, Pastor Jeff, I saw you a couple weekends ago. Hey, where was that? It was it a tournament? <laughs> and he tells me, and I heart just sank. Anyway, the point of that long, embarrassing story is that you've got to get to know somebody outside the context. And I'm thinking, who's watching? Who's watching my life? Friends, someone is always watching your life. Someone is always watching. And someone who loves you and cares deeply about you and wants to know your character outside the context, you know, of those who, when you're, when you're, when you're at your best. What the Holy Spirit wants to do is to produce spiritual fruit in our lives and the lives of others through the use of spiritual gifts, though. Now, let me just say a few words about spiritual gifts and how you know what yours are before we close. Nobody has every gift, right? Nobody does. But most of us have one or two. But you do have, all of us are to have all of the fruit. Does that make sense? No one has every gift, but all the fruit applies to you. So you can't say, well, I'm not a very loving person by nature, so I don't have to care about you, right? It doesn't work that way. Well, I don't have the gift of compassion, so I'm not going to worry about this need. We're not excused from the fruit of the Spirit because we may not have a particular gift. If you're serving, using your spiritual gift, and you're not growing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you should stop, pause and ask yourself, why? What's going on here? Okay, there's a few comments about how to identify your gifts. First thing is those clusters. Consider your cluster. Go home and think about which of those do I fit in? Am I someone who wants to teach and preach and talk about the truth? Does that excite me? Am I moved by physical and material needs in people to care for their needs? Am I, I want to do that behind the scenes even? Does that move me? Or am I someone who thinks big picture, leadership, how can we organize this? How can we direct people? How can we put people in the right spots? Which one are you? That will give you some indication. Second, consider what kinds of needs move you. you know, we have a ministry here called Master's Hands. Some of you know about that. Men in our church, Steve Salvati, former church chairman, uh, retired. He decided he wasn't going to move to Florida and play golf through his retirement. He came to Pastor Roger and said, I've got an idea. I'm pretty handy. I know some men that are handy. What if you give us a list of the widows and single moms in our church and community that need help, and we can sh pray for them and show up on a weekend and go, make, and go do projects at their house? That came out of, he was moved by a need. He knows what he's good at. So consider your cluster. Consider what moves you. What kind of needs move you? We have a ministry here called Masterpiece Ministry. Some of you know about that in Buddy Break. That came out of some women in our church who have a heart for children with special needs. It's not something that leadership sat down and said, we should do this. It came out of the people in our own church moved by these needs. Third, seek feedback from people when you serve. Those who know you and love you, but they love God more, if you know what I mean. They'll tell you the truth, you know. And, and the fourth thing, and I've said this many times before, is start serving. Don't wait around for the perfect fit. It will never come. You know, don't become a gift consumer. Well, I have the gift of evangelism, so it's up to the church. It's incumbent upon you, Pastor, to give me the perfect opportunity. Start serving. If you don't know, just figure out what process of elimination, right? Just go and get involved in the nursery. Start rocking babies. That's not it. Put them back and go do something else, you know, and serve somewhere else. You know, like just, just do something for the kingdom, and eventually you figure out, hey, this, this connects with my heart. I like this. I think I'm good at it. People are telling me I'm good at it. This is it. 
It may take you a while, but you get to know some people. Start serving. God called you and redeemed you and saved you and gifted you for a purpose, to play a part in this building up his body. And frankly, we need you. We need you. We are the body. Last question before we close. How many spirit-filled, gifted Christians would it take to change the Tri-Cities for Christ? I was at a conference just this week in, in the south side of Chicago with the Inglewood community. A friend of mine who ministers there, we were, it's a prayer and teaching conference about how to, how to change that community, and it needs it bad. People are dying there. And this man said that when he read through the Old Testament many years ago, he said it dawned on him that he, he did not know the God of the Bible, the God of power, the God who did mighty things. He said, I, I knew the God of the American culture. I said, I don't know this God that they're talking about and praying about. That, that impacted me. How many spirit-filled, gifted, serving Christians would it take to transform the Tri-Cities for Christ? Not just to hear a story now and then about somebody who had their life changed, but to see massive transformation, families getting reconciled together, marriages being restored, addicts getting freed, like children that are home, that, without, you know, that are in foster care systems finding homes, real, tangible, remarkable transformation in the culture. How many would it take? Well, in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, we're told there were 120 Christians on the planet when Jesus Ascended into heaven. That's it. About what's here tonight. I'm guessing maybe we have a few more. And it changed the world. It changed the world. Praying, serving, loving each other, and loving Christ radically, and it changed the world. We have more than enough, friends, if we'll take God's word seriously. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, we thank you and we praise you for the power of your word, for its truth, for the way it convicts us. We thank you that you have given us the greatest gift any of us could ever ask for or imagine, the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of yourself, that you reside in us and you have gifted us to play a part in the building up of your church. And your church is to be the hope of the world. Forgive us, God, for taking this lightly, for thinking of this as a game we play, something to do on a weekend to feel good about ourselves. Open our eyes, mind too, to see the opportunities all around us, to see the needs, and to look inside and to see what you have gifted us to do. And as we do this, God, may we grow in the fruit of your spirit, becoming more loving, patient, peaceful, kind, and generous people. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.